Hey everybody, welcome to Unpacking the Mass. My name is Keith Nestor. I'm so thankful that you're here with me today to study the reading for the upcoming Sunday, which is the Feast of the Transfiguration of the Lord. I love this, this event. You know, it's the fourth luminous mystery of the rosary. And for me, it's one of my favorites in my, in my book here, Unpacking the Mysteries of the Rosary, talking about these, these mysteries and the fruits that come from them. I, I think about this mystery or this event from the context of not ever taking Jesus for granted. And I think about this from the perspective of Peter, James, and John, who, of course, were taken up on the mountain with Jesus. We'll talk about all of that here later as we get into the gospel. But to think about their experience as having walked with him for three years, no matter what you're around for a while, as amazing as it can be, sometimes people can just take things for granted. So a famous person once said, never meet your heroes. And the reason why they said this was because we can easily be enamored with someone or something or whatever and have this vision of them. And then whenever we get close enough to them, if we, if we ever get the chance to do so, oftentimes we're let down. I mean, there's all kinds of stories of people who met their favorite celebrity. I thought they would be so amazing because they're such a good actor or she's such a great singer or whatever, whatever. And then I met them and they were grouchy or they didn't have time for me or whatever, you know? And it, it, it's hard sometimes when people build up certain people in their minds and then the reality kicks in and everybody's just kind of let down by that. Um, one of my favorite groups, I've talked about this before, but my, my favorite bands is Rush. And there's a famous lyric from uh, their lyricist, Neil Peart, um, rest in peace, who in their hit song, Limelight, from, from uh, back in the 80s, he wrote the following lyric. He said, I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. And he was talking about what happens when people who wait for so long to finally meet him because they're like, oh my gosh, I've been listening to your music and I love the way you play the drums and, and they get to meet him. And he's just like this shy, introverted guy who, who doesn't really have that same, you know, anticipation to meet this random person. But that person looks at him and is just like, oh my gosh. And he just says, look, I can't do that. I can't pretend a stranger is a long awaited friend. I, I, the, we, human beings can't do that. So what happens oftentimes is we, we get to know someone and we spend time with them. And then we realize a very important fact that they're a human being just like us and they've got issues, they've got problems. And I think about that sometimes when it comes to the disciples with Jesus. Now, not that Jesus had any issues or problems or whatever, but I, I could go out on a limb and say that perhaps for Peter, James, and John, who'd spent all this time with Jesus day in and day out, that Perhaps there was a level of familiarity that had set in to where they just kind of got used to being around him. I don't know, but I mean, I think it could happen. And when you think about the transfiguration, what we see in this is, is like a greater revelation of the glory of who Jesus is. He doesn't change. He's not a normal guy one day, and then they go up on the mountain, and then boom, something happens to him, and now he's transfigured and becomes something different. No, that's who we always was, as we're going to see in our first reading. So really, um, the, the, the remarkable thing isn't that Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. The remarkable thing was that Jesus was hidden under flesh from a certain perspective, if you get what I'm saying. And I know that this gets into some weird nuanced ideas about the Trinity, but I think we can safely say that the vision that we see in our first reading and in the transfiguration is, is, a, is there's a contrast between that revealed glory of Jesus and what people saw when they just looked at him. He wasn't remarkable in appearance as he walked around this earth. It wasn't like he levitated around and classical music played and his flowing hair and his piercing eyes made everyone look at him and go, oh, wow, that guy just has to be like Jesus. It's interesting. You know, people talk about their favorite uh, actor who plays Jesus. And of course, Jim Caviezel is always a favorite and, you know, one person or another. And I remember seeing one time someone was comparing their favorite Jesus against another person's favorite Jesus. And they were offering criticism of a particular actor. And the person literally just said, well, he doesn't look like Jesus. 
He doesn't look like, 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 like Jim Caviezel looks like Jesus. You know, you just look at him, wow. But this other guy, he doesn't look anything like Jesus. As if anybody knows, first of all. But what's happened is people, people have taken on this idea that Jesus in his flesh must have been this incredibly striking person from a physical perspective. But the reality is that wasn't the case. Isaiah 53 verse 2 says this about Jesus. For he grew up, this is a prophecy about him. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And that, that's interesting because we have to remember that what Jesus does as an incarnate divine person, right, it is he's, he's not trying to woo us with his physical appearance. He's trying to show us that he has become one of us. But we just can't help it, can we? We get so focused on creating this idea that Jesus must have been something special to look at. When the reality is, according to the scripture, he was just one of us. His appeal was not one of the flesh, but one of the spirit. So when people make these ridiculous statements like, well, that guy doesn't look like Jesus. This other guy does because he's way better looking. They're just speaking from their own perspective of what they've conjured up in their minds. So for Peter, James, and John to see this transfiguration was an incredible blessing to them. And as we'll see, something that completely just blew them away. But before we get to that, let's look at our first reading because this is going to show us really what we're dealing with. It's from Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 9 and 10, 13 and 14. So the first part of the book of Daniel deals with the events of his life, and then we start getting into his visions. And this is an incredible one. Okay, let's, let's read it together. As I watched, thrones were set up, and the ancient one took his throne. His clothing was bright as snow, and the hair on his head was as white as wool. His throne was flames of fire with wheels of burning fire. A surging stream of fire flowed out from where he sat. Thousands upon thousands were ministering to him, and myriads upon myriads attended him. The court was convened, and the books were opened. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the ancient one and was presented before him, the one like a son of man received dominion, glory, and kingship. All peoples, nations, and languages served him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. There's a picture in our parish of um, God the Father seated on a throne. He's got this white hair, you know, and, and I, I've had people say that that's, um, you know, Eurocentric and racist to depict God as a white man. But it's really not about God being a white man. It's about trying to to. Uh, capture this this image that we see in Daniel, where the ancient one, which is you know represents God the Father here, has this white clothing and this white as wool hair. You know we don't know what color his skin was, but we know he had white hair here in this in this text, and and we see this incredible glory. But then he gets down here, and now we see uh, one like a son of man. Now this is Jesus. Okay, this is Jesus, a vision Daniel has of Jesus before the incarnation. And we see this, it's, it's powerful, right? His dominion is everlasting dominion. And the Son of Man received dominion, glory, and kingship, and everyone serves him, friends. His kingship shall not be destroyed. So, you know, Jesus was not just a regular guy that had a revelation one day and then became the Messiah. Jesus pre-exists all of these things, right? He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There's nothing made that was not made by him. Jesus is eternal, my friends. He is God. So when we see the transfiguration, we're, we're catching a glimpse into Jesus' fuller uh, glory, right? It's not a change. It's just a greater level of revelation. And it goes all the way back here in the scripture that we see to Jan Daniel chapter 7, where this vision is, is revealed. All right, let's look at our responsorial psalm. The Lord is king, the most high over all the earth. The Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Justice and judgment are the foundation of his throne. The Lord is king, the most high over all the earth. 
The mountains melt like wax before the Lord. Before the Lord of all the earth, the heavens proclaim his justice and the peoples see his glory. The Lord is king, the most high over all the earth. Because you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth, exalted far above all gods. The Lord is king, the most high over all the earth. You know, if you saw this revelation that Daniel saw, this vision, I doubt that you would get tired of that. Right, And that's what Peter, James, and John are going to have an opportunity to see. But that's who we serve in our faith. He is our king. He is our God. And because of this, we should rejoice. We should rejoice and we should proclaim his justice and see his glory, my friends. All right, let's look at our second reading from Second Peter. Okay, Remember, Peter is up on that mountain too. And he writes these words. Beloved, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we, were, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father. When that unique declaration came to him from the majestic glory, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Moreover, we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. You will do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, of course, Peter's writing these words years after the the events, but he's still looking back on what happened. And he's saying, look, everything that I am telling you, isn't there some man-made myth or legend or some sort of trumped up idea to try to convince you or manipulate you? No, this is, this is reality. We were there. We saw this. Peter was there. He he witnessed this, but he also witnessed even something greater, of course, in the resurrection of Jesus. He knew this was real, and that's why he was willing to die the death that he died. You know, and I think about that for us. Like, what has God shown you in your life that you're just like, okay, I can't possibly deny that. We probably all got something. There, there's, I mean, we wish we had more oftentimes, but the reality is there, there have been times in our lives where we can honestly say, yeah, God showed me something amazing. How quickly then do we run away from that and forget about it? It's, it's important that we don't do that. You know, we often think, well, if God would just show me this sign or make an angel feather fall from heaven or do this or speak to me in an audible voice, then I would never doubt. I would never sin. I would never do anything wrong. Well, that's what happened to Peter. And he did all those things, right? But what persisted in his life was the revelation that he'd been given and the faith that he had. Remember, Jesus prayed for him. He said, I pray for you that your faith may not fail. And I think Jesus prays that same prayer for us. These moments of of vision and revelation are like lights that shine in the darkness. He says, you will do well to be attentive to this message as to a lamp shining in a dark place. And I want you to try to identify something like that. You know, if you're in a small group talking about unpacking the mass, maybe after this is done, Go around the room and, and share some of those, those instances in your life when, when you were sure that God had shown you something or had spoken to you about one thing or another, because it's important to point back to those markers in our lives. And I've had several in my own life where I just go, hey, I know that was God. And that those have gotten me through some tough times when I felt like, God, have, have you left me? Do you really still uh, hang around here or am I just completely outcast? And I can always go, yeah, but you know what? This is what happened. I, I know I know God is there, and, and I want to be attentive to this message. Even when the greater glory might be hidden from me in the moment, I know that he's there. All right, let's get to the gospel, my friends. This is some good stuff today. Alleluia, alleluia. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, right? That voice. Peter heard that voice, friends, and, and by God's grace, In Matthew's gospel, we have access to that. Okay, Matthew 17, 1 through 9. Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with them. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. 
Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When his disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Wow. All right, let's talk about this scripture here. First of all, people, you know, sometimes ask, well, which mountain was this? And people have different ideas. The, the most prominent idea, which is the one I'm going to go with, is that it's Mount Tabor, which is um, identified as far back as origin in the third century. And of course, St. Cyril of Jerusalem and St. Jerome, other people, other saints reference this. They're the, and that's that's kind of the, the traditional telling. Of course, it doesn't tell us exactly in the scripture. It just says a high mountain. So, you know, later on, there were Protestants who because they don't really care what tradition says. They they came up with their own ideas. So some people say Mount Hermon, which um, is the highest mountain in the area, and it says, well, Jesus went up on a high mountain, so why not the highest mountain? You know, And, and it's also kind of nearby where they were in Matthew 16 near Caesarea Philippi. Other people have proposed um, a, a place called the Horns of Hatton, um, Gebel Jermak, and uh, other other different mountains, and you know they have different reasons for that. I don't know. You know, I haven't been there yet. I'm looking forward to to going there when we go to to the Holy Land in January. I, th- I think this is on our list of places that we're going. Oh man, it's going to be exciting. But you know, the bottom line is this: at, at the end of the day, I'm just I'm going to go with what the what the church tradition teaches. And if in the end we all find out that we were wrong about that, I don't think it's like part of the deposit of faith and the you know doctrine handed down by Jesus to Peter, which mountain this was. It, I, so I don't know that it matters a whole lot, but I'm in, in matters where we don't have a definitive decree from the church, I just go with what the saints say and, and what the earliest fathers have to say. So either way, what happens on this mountain is really the point. And as we look through this description of what happens— it kind of sounds like Daniel, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like Daniel chapter 7, you know, but it's interesting. It sounds more like, you know, the father, the ancient of days than the son of man. You know, we don't see a description in Daniel of what the son of man looks like, okay? But we do see a description of what the ancient one looks like. But when you think about the Trinity, God, the son, God, the father, you know, there, there's obviously things are going to, to the, the glory of Jesus is the glory of the Father, all right? It's it's not separate glories. They're, you know, the Trinity, one God, three persons, right? But they're seeing Jesus revealed here in this incredible in this incredible moment, right? Now, why just Peter, James, and John? Why not everybody else? Again, we don't know exactly, but we do see Jesus often pulling these three aside. And it's almost like there's this, there's this hierarchy within the, his disciples. I mean, there were more than 12 disciples, right? There are 12 apostles, but there were many disciples, even the ones that were sent out, right? So there's this hierarchy of the 12 specifics that he chosen within that, the three, and then of course, within the three, the one, Peter. So Jesus brings them up and again, they hear this voice. Now they're, they're there and they see something incredible, Moses and Elijah. Of course, Moses and Elijah are heroes to Peter, James, and John. And people say, well, Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And, and here is Jesus, the, fu- the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. You can, you can wrap your mind around this in 50 different ways. And you'll probably keep discovering new things. <clears throat> but what I think is so cool about this is that instantly, you know, Peter's just like, Lord, it is good that we are here. And he just wants to camp out, literally. I'll make some tents here for these guys. Because when you're in that moment with God, I mean, I think the the, the phrase mountaintop experience with God comes from, from this text here in Matthew 17. Because we have those experiences at times. You know, I remember as a kid going to church camp, it felt like I was like walking through the throne room of God because we were so, we were so, fired up about God and it just it just felt like we were there in the presence of God all the time. And I feel that way oftentimes at mass and at adoration. And when you're in those places, there's such a temptation to never want to leave, to go back to, you know, the rest of the world and deal with with the things that you want to say. But notice Jesus doesn't say, hey, all right, I brought you up here. Let's just chill. This is going to be awesome. You guys are done. 
right? We'll leave them down there. We're all going to stay here. No, there's a purpose for this. And it's not so that Peter, James, and John can, can never leave and always be in this moment. This moment was given to them so that they could have the strength and the power to get through the things that were coming up in the, in the, the next part of the journey here with Jesus. And they would need that. Right? These men were leaders of the leaders. And Peter, of course, as the head. They would need this experience. And I guarantee you, Peter thought back on this often, as we see in, in the, the second reading for today. And when he needed strength, when he needed reassurance, when he needed to, to never fall into the temptation of taking Jesus for granted, I'm sure that he thought of this. And we hear the voice from the, from the Father in heaven, hid behind a cloud, of course. you know, I think that's powerful to think about, too. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Well, where have we heard this voice before, right? I talked about the, this being the fourth luminous mystery of the rosary. Well, the first luminous mystery of the rosary is the baptism of Jesus. And we hear the voice and the same message, you know. And this is the message that we need to hear too, my friends. Jesus is the beloved son of the father whom he is well pleased. Listen to him. That message never changes, my friends. That, that message never gets old. And of course, when they have this experience, they hit the ground in fear, but Jesus doesn't say, that's right, you guys stay down there. No, he touches them and says, be not afraid, be not afraid. And when it was all over, what did they see? No, nothing, no one but Jesus, right? That's a picture for all of us. Because when we are overwhelmed with fear, and even fear of the Lord, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, it's okay to be afraid of God, fear of the Lord. Well, Fear is a paralyzing thing. Remember, when the Bible talks about fear of the Lord, the, the, the way that it's described to us is a healthy fear that is born out of respect, but it's not a fear that is supposed to lead to paralyzation. But oftentimes it does. We can be paralyzed by fear either because we're afraid of, of um, the bad stuff in the world and we're like, well, I don't want, I don't want to go out into the evil, bad, wicked world. Bad things are going to happen to me. So we can be paralyzed in fear and never want to leave the church and never want to, to, to have relationships with anybody other than our, our little holy huddle. Or we can have this healthy fear of the Lord, but yet be so afraid of disappointing him that we don't do anything. And both of those are the wrong response. Remember the parable of the servants and the, and the talents. The, the one who was declared to be an unfit, lazy servant was one who didn't do anything. Why? Because he was paralyzed by fear. He said, I know you are a, a, a basically a powerful master and you're a, you're a judge. And I was afraid that I would lose what, what you had entrusted me. So I just buried it in the ground. Friends, we, can, we have to be careful that we're not like that. That's not just about a guy who's like, oh, I don't care, I'm lazy. No, that's about a guy who's afraid, who's paralyzed by fear of God. And that can happen to us too. How many of us out here, my friends, are so afraid that we're going to mess something up that we just don't want to even entertain the idea of talking to anybody about Jesus or stepping out in our faith in any way because we're so paralyzed that we're not good enough, that we're going to mess up, and that we're going to let God down. Here's the thing. The only way you let God down is if you do nothing, is if you or disobey, which is the same thing. You're not going to disobey God by going out and, and putting yourself out there to do the work of the kingdom because he's going to go with you and he's going to accomplish through you what he has purpose for you. Will you do it perfectly? No, none of these guys did either. But God still worked through them and used them and continues to use them. And he's going to continue to use you but you've got to get out of this moment of fear that paralyzes you. So you can fool yourself into thinking that, well, because my fear is that I don't want to let God down, that's a better fear than the fear of I don't want to suffer. Hey, the end result is the same. You not doing what God wants you to do or me not doing what God wants me to do. So Jesus says, rise and do not be afraid. Rise and do not be afraid. And that could be taken lots of ways, but I, I want you to take it this way. If you're the person that's been so afraid of failure because you love Jesus so much and you, you're also afraid of him, 
then rise and do not be afraid because if you put yourself out there and respond to him in obedience and go out and acknowledge him before men, he will acknowledge you before the Father. You won't let him down. And if you're afraid to suffer, so you're like, oh, I don't want to do anything because it's mean, it's nasty out there, people are scary, then it's time for you to rise and not be afraid because Jesus will walk with you and walk ahead of you through all of that stuff, my friend. Never forget in the dark what God has shown you in the light. I've said that so many times. You know, I've heard that so many times in my life. And I think about that often when I think about and meditate on this, this uh, transfiguration, okay? Because we have these moments where God has given these things to us and given these things to Peter for us and James and John for us. Remember, he, he didn't keep this secret. He said, Don't tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Well, that happened, and now here we are. This was given so that we could receive what we need from it, just like Peter did. That's why Peter's able to say, look, we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. You will do well to be attentive to it. He says, we ourselves heard this voice. We are eyewitnesses of his majesty, friends. We hear their testimony, and believe. So as you meditate today on the Feast of the Transfiguration, as you prepare yourself for that, I want you to allow yourself to identify those times in your life when God has shown you something powerful. And then I also want you to identify where right now in your life fear is keeping you from doing what Jesus wants you to do. And then I want you to Imagine him reaching down, touching you, saying, rise, do not be afraid. Let's talk about that together, my friends. If, if you're in a group, like I said, talk about it with people around you. If not, hey, maybe the comment section can be our small group. So share with us some of those events down there if you're watching this on YouTube. I guess if you're listening to it on a podcast, you know, maybe um, you know, give somebody a call and invite someone to listen to this with you and have that conversation. It's powerful when we do that, my friends. Remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. He didn't just take Peter. You know, These three guys needed to have these moments together where they could, you remember that one time? Yeah, that was awesome. Friends, it'll be the same way for each of us as well. I hope you've enjoyed this. If, if anything, I hope that looking through these texts brings a new level of energy and, and excitement to when you pray the Luminous Mysteries. You know, we've, we've touched on the first one there with, with the baptism of Jesus and the voice of the heaven. And of course, the fourth luminous mystery here, which is the transfiguration. Next time we pray that, which will be on Thursday, by the way, um, you know, let yourself go there as you meditate on this and think of the glory of God. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Once again, on Unpacking the Mass, I look forward to being back here with you next week, my friends. Take care and God bless.